Homegoing is the debut historical fiction novel by Ghanaian-American author Y.A.A. Giasi, published in 2016. Each chapter in the novel follows a different descendant of an Asante woman named Mame, starting with her two daughters, who are half-sisters, separated by circumstance. Effia marries James Collins, the British governor in charge of Cape Coast Castle, while her half-sister S.C. is held captive in the dungeons below. Subsequent chapters follow their children and following generations. The novel was selected in 2016 for the National Book Foundation's 5 Under 35 Inches Award, the National Book Critics Circle's John Leonard Award for Best First Book, and was longlisted for the Dylan Thomas Prize in 2017. It received the Hemingway Foundation Penn Award for 2017, an American Book Award, and the Vilcek Prize for Creative Promise in Literature. Y.A.A. Giasi, born 1989, is a Ghanaian-American novelist. Her debut novel Homegoing, published in 2016, won her, at the age of 26, the National Book Critics Circle's John Leonard Award for Best First Book, the Penn Hemingway Award for a First Book of Fiction, the National Book Foundation's 5 Under 35 Inches Honors for 2016 and the American Book Award. She was awarded a Vilcek Prize for Creative Promise in Literature in 2020. One, as of 2016, Giasi lives in Berkeley, California. Plot. Edit. Effia's Line. Edit. Effia is raised by her mother, Baba, who is cruel to her. Nevertheless, she works hard to please her mother. Known as a beauty, Effia is intended to be married to the future chief of her village, but when her mother tells her to hide her menstrual cycle, rumors spread that she is barren. As a result, she is married to a British merchant, James Collins, the governor of Cape Coast Castle. He and Effia have a happy marriage. She returns to her family. Village one time, when her father dies, where her brother tells her that Baba is not Effia's mother and that Effia is the daughter of an unknown slave. Effia and James have a son called Quay who is raised in the Cape Coast castle. His parents, worrying that he is friendless, eventually have him befriend a local boy named Kudjo. When they are teenagers Quay and Kudjo realize that they are attracted to one another. In fear of their relationship James sends Quay to England for a while. When he returns, Quay is assigned to help to strengthen the ties between his familial village and the British merchants at the Cape Coast castle. He is frustrated by his uncle Fifi, who seems evasive about trade relations. Eventually, Fifi, along with Kudjo, raid the village of the Asante people and bring back the daughter of an Asante chief. Realizing that to marry her would join his people, the Fantis, with the Asantes, Quay resolves to forget Kudjo and marry the Asante girl. Quay's son, James, learns that his Asante grandfather died and returns to Asante land where he meets a farmer woman, Akasu Amensa. Growing up with his parents' dysfunctional political marriage, and promised since childhood to the daughter of the Fanti chief, Ama, James longs to run away and marry Akasua. With help from Effia, James runs away from Ama and lives among the Afutu people until they are raided and killed by the Asantes. He is saved by a man who recognizes him though James makes him promise to tell everyone he has died. He then travels to reunite with Akasua. James's daughter Abena only knows her father is a rural farmer called unlucky for his inability to grow crops. By the time she is 25 she is still unmarried. Her childhood best friend, Oheen, promises to marry her. After his next successful season and the two renew an affair which coincides with the start of a famine. The village elders, discovering the affair, tell them that if Abena conceives a child or the famine lasts more than seven years Abena will be cast out. In the sixth year Oheen successfully pioneers the introduction of cocoa plants. Rather than marry Abena he reveals that he promised to marry the daughter of the farmer who gave him the seeds. Abena, now pregnant, decides to leave her village rather than wait for Oheen to marry her. Akua grows up among white missionaries after her mother dies early in her childhood. When an Asante man proposes, she accepts and marries him and the couple have several children. She is traumatized to learn that her mother died while being baptized, and by seeing her fellow villagers burn a white traveler alive. Before the birth of her third child Akua begins to have nightmares about a woman on fire with burning children. Her nightmares cause her to avoid sleep and enter a trance-like state while awake, and as a result her mother-in-law locks her in the hut to prevent other village people seeing her in her strange state. At the same time the British provoke a third war against them and her husband goes to fight. He, returns missing one leg, in time for the birth of their son, Ya. The nightmares continue to haunt Akua and, while sleepwalking during a trance at night, she kills her daughters by setting a fire that consumes them. Her husband is able to save Ya and successfully prevent Akua from being burned herself by the townspeople. 
Ya grows up to be a schoolteacher who is highly educated but angry about his facial burn scars. His friends encourage him to marry even though he is near the age of 50, as his self-consciousness has kept him alone until that point. After his friends go through a difficult pregnancy he decides to take on a house girl, Esther. The two of them speak Twee together, Esther is unfazed by Ya's anger and asks him constant questions about his way of life, and he realizes he loves her. To please Esther he goes to see his mother, now known as the crazy woman, for the first time in over 40 years in Edweso where they reconcile, and she tells him that there is evil in their line and that she regrets causing the fire that burned him. Marjorie grows up in Alabama, which she hates, and spends summers in Ghana visiting her grandmother, who has moved from Edweso to the Gold Coast. In her mostly white high school she struggles to fit in as the black students mock her for acting white and the white students don't want to have anything to do with her. She feels left out as although she is black, she doesn't identify with the African-American stereotype that all blacks in America are lumped into. While reading in the library she meets a German-born army brat, Graham, and develops a crush on him hoping he will ask her to prom. Instead his father and the school ban them from attending together and he instead goes with a white girl. She reads a poem about her Ghanaian origin and ancestors during an African-American cultural day at her high school, which her father attends. Her grandmother dies shortly after, before Marjorie is able to make it back to Ghana. ESI's line, edit. S.E. is the beloved and beautiful daughter of a big man and his wife, Mame. Her father is a renowned and successful warrior and he eventually captures a slave who asks S.E. to send a message to her father about where she is. S.E. complies out of pity as her mother was formerly enslaved. As a result her village is raided and her father and mother are killed. Before she leaves S.E. learns that her mother, while she was enslaved, had a child before her, then set a fire and left the baby with Baba. S.E. is then captured and imprisoned in the dungeon of the Cape Coast Castle where she is raped by a drunken merchant before being sent to North America. She is unable to retrieve the stone she buried for safety in the depths of the dungeon. ESI's daughter, Ness, is raised in the American South. Her mother teaches her some twee but she and her mother are eventually beaten for it and separated. In her new, more lenient plantation, Ness is forbidden from becoming a house slave because of the deep scars on her back. Before arriving at the plantation Ness was forcibly married by her master to Sam, a Yoruba man and fellow slave on the same plantation. Although he spoke no English, they eventually came to love one another and have a child, whom she named Kojo. After a woman heard her speaking twee, Ness was offered the opportunity to escape north. Ness, the woman, Sam, and Kojo escaped but in an effort to protect her son, she and her husband allowed themselves to be caught and then claimed their child died, allowing the woman to escape with Kojo. Ness was severely whipped, causing her brutal scars, and forced to watch as Sam is hanged. Kojo is raised in Baltimore where he goes by the name Joe Freeman and marries a freeborn black woman Anna. Kojo works on the ships in the Baltimore Harbor while Anna cleans for a white family, and the entire family lives with Ma, the woman who helped Kojo escape when he was a baby. When Anna is pregnant with their eighth child, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 is passed. Joe is warned that he should go further north but he decides to stay. The white family Anna works for helps Kojo and Ma forge papers saying they were born free, but Kojo still worries he or his family will be kidnapped. His oldest daughter marries the pastor's son, and soon after, Anna disappears while pregnant. Kojo looks for her for weeks but is unable to find her, only hearing that a white man asked her to enter a carriage with him at the last sighting. The kidnapping destroys Joe's family. H, the last son born to Anna and Kojo, is freed during the Reconstruction era, and has never known his parents, with Anna dying shortly after. Childbirth Sometime after, as an adult man, he is arrested and wrongly accused of assaulting a white woman. Unable to pay the $10 fine he is sentenced to work in a coal mine for 10 years. One day a white convict is assigned as his partner and he is unable to shovel any coal, so H shovels the 12-ton daily quota for the both of them with two hands simultaneously, earning him the nickname, Two Shovel H. When H is released from his sentence he settles in Pratt City in Birmingham, Alabama, made up of other ex-convicts both black and white, and works in the coal mine as a free agent. Unable to read or write, he asks a friend's son to write a letter to his ex-girlfriend F, whom he cheated on shortly before being arrested. She eventually comes to join him. H's daughter Willie marries Robert, her childhood sweetheart who is light-skinned with light eyes, and they have a son named Carson. After her parents die Robert suggests they move away and Willie asks that they go to Harlem as she wants to start a career as a singer. 
As they look for work Willie realizes that her too dark skin will prevent her from being a professional singer while Robert is able to pass for white. The two grow farther apart as Robert finds a job in white Manhattan while Willie cleans bars in Harlem. They begin keeping secrets from one another, and Robert returns home less and less. One night, Willie sees Robert vomiting in the men's bathroom during her job at a bar, and Robert's white co-workers find out their relationship. One of the co-workers have the two of them touch each other as he sexually pleasures himself, and then fires Robert. That night, Robert leaves her. Willie eventually begins a new relationship with Eli and has a daughter, Josephine. One day, when Carson is 10, Willie sees Robert in Manhattan with a white wife and their white child. The two make eye contact, and Willie suddenly realizes that she forgives Robert. Her anger, sadness, confusion and loss subside, and she finds her voice again. Carson, who is an adult goes by the name Sonny, tries to find meaning in marching for civil rights and working for the NAACP but instead becomes demoralized by his work. Like his own father he becomes an absentee parent to three children by three different women, often dodging their requests for alimony. He meets a young singer named Amani and after she introduces him to drugs he becomes addicted to heroin as well. He spends all of his money on drugs and realizes he never loved Amani, but only wanted her. When Willie finally reveals details about his father and offers him a choice between her money or getting clean he chooses to stay with his mother and get clean. Sonny and Amani's son Marcus goes on to become an academic at Stanford University. At a party near campus, he meets Marjorie, also a graduate student at Stanford, and the two form an intimate bond. The two of them go to Pratt City so Marcus can research his African-American history thesis, and Marcus realizes there is nothing there for him, Marjorie's parents have also both passed away. Marjorie suggests that they go to Ghana and while they are there visiting the villages of Marjorie's grandmother, they go to the Cape Coast castle which Marjorie has never visited. While seeing the door of no return, in the slave dungeon, Marcus has a panic attack and flees through the door to the beach. He and Marjorie swim in the water where she gives him Effia's stone, which has been passed to her through the generations, and which, unbeknownst to both of them, was given to Effia by their mutual ancestor, Mame. ESI's stone remains unrecovered, buried in the dungeons of the castle. Major themes. Edit. The novel touches on several notable historical events, from the introduction of cacao as a crop in Ghana and the Anglo-Asante wars in Ghana to slavery, segregation, the convict leasing system, the Great Migration, and the Jazz Age in Harlem in America. 2. Because of the novel's scope, which covers several hundred years of history and 14 characters, it has been described as a novel in short stories, where each chapter is forced to stand on its own. 3. In addition to the above historical events, this novel explores several literary themes and motifs, including the upstairs, downstairs trope. 4. This effect is first demonstrated by Effia literally living above her half sister S.E., unaware of the atrocities occurring in the basement of the Cape Coast Castle. Then themes of generational trauma and guilt follow these two lineages as ESI's lineage has to cope with the impacts of slavery and structural racism in the U.S. and Effia's line copes with the limited knowledge of the role their family played in the transatlantic slave trade. Development History Edit In the summer of 2009, following her sophomore year at Stanford University, Giasi took a trip to Ghana sponsored by a research grant. 5. 6. Although Giasi was born in Ghana, she moved to the United States as an infant, and this was her first trip back. 6. On a friend's prompting, they visited the Cape Coast Castle, where she found her inspiration in the contrast between the luxurious upper levels, for colonists and their local families, and the misery of the dungeons below, where slaves were kept. 6. She relates, I just found it really interesting to think about how there were people walking around upstairs who were unaware of what was to become of the people living downstairs. 6. Giasi says the family tree came first, and each chapter, which follows one descendant, is tied to a significant historical event, five, although she described the research as wide but shallow. Six, the door of no return by British historian William St. Clair helped to form the descriptions of life in and around the castle in the first few chapters. Seven, eight, one of the final chapters, entitled, Marjorie, is inspired by Giasi's experiences as part of an immigrant family living in Alabama. 6. 5. Dot, dot, dot. I think I was kind of constantly interacting, I guess, with really what the legacy of slavery is. You know, coming from a country, Ghana, that had a role in slavery, and then ending up in a place where slavery is still so strongly felt institutionally, as racism is still so strongly felt. The irony of that wasn't lost on me.
And I think, had I not grown up in Alabama, I don't know that I would have ever written this book. Y.A.A. Giasi, 2016 interview with Scott Simon, 8 before the official publication in June 2016, Times Sarah Begley called it, one of the summer's most anticipated novels. 5. Critics reviewed Giasi's first novel with almost universally high acclaim. 9. The New York Times Book Review listed it as an editor's choice, writing, This wonderful debut by a Ghanaian-American novelist follows the shifting fortunes of the progeny of two half-sisters, unknown to each other, in West Africa and America. 10. Jennifer Maloney of the Wall Street Journal noted the author received an advance of more than one million United States dollars and praised the plot as, flecked with magic, evoking folk tales passed down from parent to child, also noting the novel has, structural and thematic similarities to Alex Haley's Pulitzer Prize-winning 1976 book, Roots. 1. One Christian Lawrenson of New York Magazine said, each chapter is tightly plotted, and there are suspenseful, even spectacular climaxes. 1. Two, Anita Felicelli of the San. Francisco Chronicle said that Giassi is a young writer whose stellar instincts, sturdy craftsmanship and penetrating wisdom seem likely to continue apace, much to our good fortune as readers. 13. Isabel Wilkerson of the New York Times described her as a stirringly gifted young writer. 14. Wilkerson also commented on the difference between the lyrical language of the West African passages and the coarser language and surface descriptions of life in America. 14. Wilkerson expressed some disappointment. It is dispiriting to encounter such a worn-out cliché, that African Americans are hostile to reading and education, in a work of such beauty. 14. Steph Cha, writing for the Los Angeles Times, notes, the characters are, by necessity, representatives for entire eras of African and Black American history, which means some of them embody a few shortcuts, in advancing the narrative and themes, but overall, the sum of Homegoing's parts is remarkable, a panoramic portrait of the slave trade and its reverberations. 3. Laura Miller, writing for The New Yorker, said that while parts of homegoing show the unmistakable touch of a gifted writer, the novel is a specimen of what such a writer can do when she bites off more than she is ready to chew, noting the form of the novel would daunt a far more practiced novelist, as the form, composed of short stories linked by ancestors and descendants, isn't the ideal way to deliver the amount of exposition that historical fiction requires. 2. Maureen Corrigan, reviewing for National Public Radio noted the plot was, pretty formulaic, and it, would have been a stronger novel if it had ended sooner, but, the feel of her novel is mostly sophisticated, and she concluded that, so many moments earlier on in this strong debut novel linger. 1-5 Machiko Kakutani noted in her New York Times review the novel, often feels deliberate and earthbound, the reader is aware, especially in the American chapters, that significant historical events and issues, have been shoehorned into the narrative, and that characters have been made to trudge through experiences, meant, in some way, to be representative, but it also, makes us experience the horrors of slavery on an intimate, personal level, by its conclusion, the characters' tales of loss and resilience have acquired an inexorable and cumulative emotional weight. One six other reviewers were not as critical of the novel's structure. Jean Zimmerman, also writing for National Public Radio, praised the novel as, a remarkable achievement, saying that, narrative, as earnest, well-crafted yet not overly self-conscious, marvelous without being precious. 1-7. Lilani Clark at KQED Arts wrote, Until every American embarks on a major soul-searching about the venal, sordid racial history of the United States, and their own position in relation to it, the bloodshed, tears, and anger will keep on. Let homegoing be an inspiration to begin that process. 1-8. In 2019, the book was listed and paced as the third greatest novel of the 2010s. 1-9. On November 5, 2019, the BBC News listed Homegoing on its list of the 100 most influential novels. 2-0. Oh. On the night that a fire rages between the woods of Fanteland and Asanteland, Effia is born. Throughout her childhood, her mother, Baba, is extremely cruel. As Effia grows, Baba tells her to keep the fact that she has begun menstruating a secret so that she cannot marry their village's new chief. Instead, Effia is sent to marry the British governor of Cape Coast Castle, James Collins. While pregnant, Effia returns to her village as her father is dying. There, she learns from her brother Fifi that Baba was not her real mother. Her mother was an enslaved girl named Mame who ran away into the fire the night Effia was born. Though Effia doesn't know this, Mame married a big man in an Asante village and gave birth to another girl, Essie. 
Essie has a privileged childhood but is captured at 15 and taken to the dungeon of the Cape Coast Castle. There, she is raped and then put on a slave ship to America. Effia's son Quay has a lonely childhood at the castle, though he makes friends with a boy named Kudjo. However, after Quay's father witnesses a tender moment between the two boys, he sends Quay to live in London. Quay later goes to his mother's village to help his uncle, Fifi, with his work in the slave trade. Though this is not the life Quay wants, he marries the daughter of an Asante king, Nana Yaa, whom Fifi kidnapped. Meanwhile, ESI's daughter Ness is enslaved on a plantation in Alabama. At a previous plantation, she was forced to marry another slave, Sam, and they had a child named Kojo. One day, Ness, Sam, and Kojo attempt to escape with the help of a woman named Aku, but Ness and Sam are caught. Back at the plantation, Ness is whipped and Sam is lynched. When Quay and Nana Yaw's son, James, travels with them to Nana Yaw's father's funeral, he becomes enamored with a girl named Akasua, who chastises his family's involvement in the slave trade. Though James is promised to marry another woman, he's determined to marry Akasua. Eventually, James fakes his own death and finds Akasua. On ESI's side, Aku and Kojo escape to Maryland, where Kojo, or, Joe, works as a deckhand. Joe and his wife Anna worry about their family's safety after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act. One day, Anna doesn't return home from work. After a few weeks, Joe learns that Anna was taken by a white man. Once his children are grown, a broken Joe moves to New York. Quay and Akasua's daughter, Abena, is unmarried at the age of 25, though she is waiting for her childhood friend Ohin Niarko to take her as his second wife. Abena and Ohin begin sleeping together, but he cannot promise to marry her until he has a good harvest. For years, the harvest is bad, and the village blames Abena. Eventually, Ohin is able to grow cocoa but promised to marry the daughter of the man who sold the plants to him. No pregnant, Abena leaves the village for a missionary church. In America, Joe and Anna's son H is born on a plantation just after Anna has killed herself. H works as a sharecropper after the Civil War. After being arrested for looking at a white woman, H works in the mines as a convict. When his sentence is up, H moves to Pratt City, where he continues to work in mines but joins a union to fight for better pay and working conditions. Though his wife, Eth, left him years earlier, he writes to her, and she returns to him. Abena's daughter, Akua, grows up in the missionary where her mother Abena lived after leaving the village. Akua leaves the church after the missionary tells her he drowned Abena while attempting to baptize her. Akua marries and has two daughters and a son, though she is plagued by dreams of a woman made of fire. One night, in her sleep, Akua burns her family's hut. Only Akua, her husband, and her son, Ya, survive. Meanwhile, H and Eth's daughter, Willie, moves to Harlem with her husband, Robert, and their son, Carson. Robert is light-skinned and passes as white in Harlem, which allows him to easily find work. One night, while cleaning a jazz club, Willie runs into Robert in the bathroom, and Robert's white colleagues force him to assault her. Robert then leaves Willie. A few years later, Willie sees Robert with a white wife and son. Ya grows up to be a history teacher, though he has trouble finding a wife due to the scars on his face from the fire his mother set. He eventually falls in love with his house girl, Esther. She encourages Ya to make peace with Akua, whom he hasn't seen since he was a baby. Ya and Esther visit Akua, who explains that she set the fire because she was haunted by the evil in their lineage. Ya forgives his mother. Willie's son Carson, who now goes by the name Sonny, works for the NAACP and is involved in the civil rights movement, though he feels frustrated with the lack of progress. Sonny becomes addicted to heroin after a woman, Amani, introduces him to the drug. One day, Willie explains to Sonny what happened to his father. With this knowledge, Sonny decides to finally get clean. Ya and Esther move to Alabama with their daughter, Marjorie. Marjorie feels a deep connection to her grandmother and to Ghana and does not fit in with either the black or white kids in Alabama. Marjorie develops feelings for her friend Graham, a white boy, though he feels they cannot be together due to their different races. Marjorie later meets Marcus, Sonny and Amani's son, while they are both graduate students at Stanford. Marcus and Marjorie travel together to Ghana, where Marcus is overwhelmed with emotions on visiting the Cape Coast Castle. They swim together in the water, and Marjorie welcomes Marcus home. Homegoing tells the story of seven generations of a family split in two, one side remains in Africa while the other is brought to America on a slave ship. 
The novel begins from the perspective of two sisters who are unaware of each other, yet their lives are largely similar until a twist of fate sends one to live in luxury at the Cape Coast Castle and the other to be imprisoned in the dungeon of that same castle. Effia, who has been abused by the woman she believes to be her mother for her entire life, is sent to marry a British governor instead of marrying the village chief as promised by her father. Though Effia does not have much power under these circumstances, her marriage makes her and her descendants complicit in the slave trade. Her sister, Essie, has a privileged childhood, much like Effia. However, after trying to reunite her enslaved house girl with the girl's father, Essie is captured, enslaved, and sent to America. For the next six generations, each of their descendants will grapple with how where they came from affects who they are and how they can break the cycle of trauma and suffering that has plagued each member of their family. The inciting incident of the novel occurs when Mame, Effia and Essie's mother, sets the fire that allows her to escape captivity in Fantelland. Effia is then left to be cared for by a resentful Baba, who essentially exiles Effia from her home by forcing her marriage to James Collins. The fire will continue to represent Effia's family's legacy in the slave trade, even as her descendants try to leave it behind. This incident is also what leads to the birth of S.E., who is sent to America on a slave ship. ESI's descendants will feel the pain that is passed down to each generation under slavery, imprisonment, institutional racism, and drug addiction. Effia's side retains a physical reminder of generations that came before in the form of the black stone pendant left behind for her by Mame. This also serves as a reminder of the crimes that plague the family. However, Essie was unable to bring the black stone pendant on the slave ship with her, which condemns her descendants to never truly know their family's history. The rising action of the novel occurs as each family member attempts to improve their station in life, only to meet barriers that often prevent this. For those who remain in Africa, these barriers come in the form of colonization, which they find difficult to fully escape. Even when James breaks away from his family's business in the slave trade, his daughter Abena must seek out a Christian missionary school when she becomes pregnant. She is then drowned when the missionary is trying to baptize her showing how colonization has devastating consequences even when done with supposedly good intentions. Abena's daughter, Akua, then cannot escape dreams representing her family's crimes, showing how the legacy of slavery lingers long after it is gone. Meanwhile, ESI's descendants in America struggle to break the cycle of generational trauma as well. Even after the Civil War, black men like H are targeted and imprisoned, enslaved once again in the mines instead of a plantation. Even though H is able to create a better life for his family, his grandson, Sonny, becomes addicted to heroin, showing how difficult it is to fully escape the oppression of systemic racism. However, with support from family, each side is eventually able to make peace with their family's past. Akua, who unintentionally killed her two daughters by setting fire to their hut, understands that there was evil in her family's lineage. By facing this evil, she is able to find peace and forgiveness from her son, Ya. Sonny, addicted to heroin, decides to get clean after learning the truth about why his father abandoned him. Both cases show how seeing the past clearly can help people more fully understand their own identity. The climax of homegoing occurs when Effia's and ESI's final descendants, Marjorie and Marcus, meet at Stanford. Marjorie and Marcus are unaware of their relation yet feel at home with each other, exploring each side's history. In Ghana, back at the castle where Effia and Essie briefly lived in the same place, Marjorie and Marcus encourage each other to face their fears. In Marjorie's case, it is fire, the element that burned her grandmother and father and that haunted her family for so long. In Marcus's case, it is water, the element that took Essie and so many other enslaved people from their home. As they face these fears and as Marjorie gives Marcus Effia's pendant, both branches of the family have reunited and made peace, giving hope for the fates of generations to come. Effia is born on the night of a raging fire in Fantelland. As she grows up, her mother, Baba, is cruel to her and abuses her, while her father, Cobb, is kind. When Effia turns 12, she begins to blossom into a young woman. She hopes to marry the next chief of the village, but Baba has other plans for her. She tells Effia to hide her blood, and then contrives to have her marry a British man named James Collins who is the newly appointed governor of the Cape Coast Castle. Before Effia is married, Baba gives her a black stone pendant, a piece of her mother. Effia and James Collins are then married and develop sincere affection for each other when she moves into the castle. However, she quickly discovers that there are women in the dungeons being traded as slaves. 
Though she is horrified, she knows she cannot go back to her village, and only returns years later when she hears her father is dying. When Effia is at her father's deathbed, her brother, Fifi, reveals that she is not actually Baba's daughter. Her real mother, Mame, had been a house girl for Cobb, and ran away the night Effia was born. The black stone from Baba is really from Mame. Meanwhile, Essie is trapped in the women's dungeon in the Cape Coast castle. Soldiers come and go, groping the women and taking away their children. Essie was born in Asantelan to a respected warrior, Kwame Asari. The Asantis had been raiding other villages for years, capturing prisoners and taking them as slaves and servants. Her mother, Mame, took one of these prisoners as a house girl, but the girl Abranoma was not very skilled at housework and was often beaten. Essie felt bad for her, and agreed to send a message to her father, telling him where she was. One night, Abranoma's father and other warriors attacked the village, but Mame was too afraid to run. She gave Essie a black stone, and Essie ran away. She was quickly captured and taken to the castle, made to walk for days with little water and food. Back in the dungeon, a soldier pulls her out and rapes her before returning her to the prison. Days later, Essie and the other women are taken onto a ship, but she loses her stone in the dungeon. Quay, Effia's son, is back in his mother's village in order to make a deal regarding slave prices. Quay had been a lonely child, always feeling that he wasn't white or black. He made friends with a boy named Kudjo from another village, but when his father, James Collins, saw how close the two boys were, he sent Quay to school in London. Quay returned after his father's death, but still felt his father's disappointment. Quay doesn't want to participate in the slave trade but also doesn't want to be seen as weak. When his uncle Fifi captures Nana Yaa, the daughter of an Asante king, to strengthen their political union, Quay agrees to marry her. Ness, ESI's daughter, is working on Thomas Allen Stockham's Alabama plantation. She doesn't speak to her fellow slaves much, as her mother had been a solid, quiet woman with a hard heart. However, Ness does find a soft spot for a young, motherless girl named Pinky, who refuses to speak. One day, the master's son tries to get Pinky to speak and threatens to beat her, but Ness stops him. As Ness awaits her punishment for speaking out, she thinks about how she ended up there. At her prior plantation, she and another slave named Sam had been married. After the birth of their son, Kojo, they tried to escape with a woman named Aku. One night, when Ness gave Kojo to Aku to hold, Ness and Sam were caught by their former master, whom they referred to as the devil, but Aku and Kojo were able to escape. Ness had then been whipped until she couldn't stand, and Sam had been hanged. Back in the present, Ness only hopes that her son is okay. James Quay's son Quay, and Nana Yaa travel to Asantelan for her father's funeral, where James meets a girl named Akasua who refuses to shake his hand because his family takes part in the slave trade. He finds her fascinating but knows that he would never be able to marry her. Still, he promises that if she waits for him, he will come back for her. When he returns to Fanteland, he is married to another woman but refuses to consummate their marriage while he plots to get back to Akasua. He fakes his death in a battle and walks back to Asanteland, where Akasua is waiting for him. Joe Kojo, Ness's son, works in Baltimore on ships, having escaped with Ma'aku from slavery as a baby. He and his wife, Anna, who is also free, have six children and a seventh whom they call H on the way. Joe is afraid of the law enforcement in the city and constantly worried that he will be re-enslaved. On the day of his daughter's wedding, the Fugitive Slave Act passes, meaning that if Joe is found out as a runaway, he can be sent back to the south to work on a plantation. One day, his wife does not return home. He looks for her for days, to no avail, until a young boy says that he saw a white man take her into his carriage. Ten years pass, and Joe moves up New York as more states start to secede, and the Civil War brews. Abena, James's daughter, is 25 years old and still unmarried. She is in love with a man named Ohin Niarko, who cannot marry her until the harvest is good, but they still begin an affair. When the harvests in the village continue to be bad, they blame Abena for witchcraft. Ohin travels to another city and acquires a cocoa plant, which grows well, but he promises the man he buys it from that he will marry his daughter in return. Abena, now pregnant, refuses to wait any longer for him and travels back to the heart of Asantelan to seek out the missionary church there. Joe and Anna's son, H, was born on a plantation. His mother killed herself before he was born, so he had to be cut out of her stomach. Although he was freed after the war, 
he is quickly imprisoned for looking at a white woman and sold to the mining system. He works in brutal conditions for nine years before obtaining freedom again and then works in the mines as a free laborer. He joins a union, strikes for better conditions, and reunites with his woman, Eth. Akua, Abena's daughter, grows up in the missionary church, where she's made to feel like a sinner and a heathen. She leaves the church to marry Asamoa, but visions of a firewoman with two children plague her. She cannot sleep, and one night she sets their hut on fire, killing two of her daughters and scarring her infant son, Ya. Willie, H's daughter, marries a light-skinned boy named Robert Clifton when she is young, and the two move up to Harlem with their son, Carson. Robert has an easier time getting jobs, but he often loses them when people find out that he is not white. Willie cleans houses, but at night she works at a jazz club. While cleaning the bathroom at the club one night, she runs into Robert, who with two of his white co-workers. Realizing that they are married, the two white men force Robert to violate Willie for their own enjoyment. Robert leaves that night, and Willie tries to restart her life with another man named Eli. Ya, Akua's son, teaches history at an all-boys Roman Catholic high school. He is passionate about securing Ghanaian independence and resents his mother, because her actions left him with a severe facial burn. He gets a house girl named Esther, who convinces him to go to see his mother. The two are able to reconcile as Akua explains the evil that plagues their family history and that haunted her. Sunny Carson's nickname grows up resentful of Willie because she refuses to speak about Robert. He joins the civil rights movement and finds himself in and out of jail for marching. One day, he goes to a jazz club and becomes taken with a singer named Amani. Amani introduces him to dope, and Sonny quickly becomes addicted. His mother stops speaking to him until he resolves to get clean. Marjorie, Ya and Esther's daughter, is born in Ghana but grows up in Alabama. She has trouble making friends in high school because the white students think she is black, while the black students think she sounds and acts like a white girl. Thus, she spends most of her time reading and writing, and dates a white boy named Graham before his father puts an end to their relationship. She goes back to Ghana every summer to visit her grandmother Akua, with whom she is very close. The final chapter in the novel focuses on Marcus, Sonny and Amani's son. Marcus is getting his PhD in sociology from Stanford. He focuses his studies on the convict leasing system that condemned his great-grandfather H, but he quickly realizes that there are many more subjects surrounding systematic oppression in America that he wants to discuss. While at Stanford, he meets Marjorie, who is also a graduate student. The two become friends, taking a trip to Birmingham together and then a trip to Ghana. In Ghana, Marcus and Marjorie are both struck by their mutual history at the Cape Coast Castle. They run into the water together on the beach, and Marjorie gives him the stone necklace that she inherited from her grandmother. She welcomes him home in a final act of reconciliation between the two families. Homegoing is a historical fiction novel by Y.A.A. Giasi, a Ghanaian-American novelist born in 1989. Homegoing was published in 2016 and was awarded the 2017 Hemingway Foundation Penn Award, the 2016 John Leonard Prize for Outstanding Debut Novel, and the National Book Foundation's 5 Under 35 Award in 2016. Written in the tradition of Alex Haley's roots, the saga of an American family 1976 Giasi tells the story of one 18th century Akan family, tracking it across seven generations after it is split into two by the transatlantic slave trade. Homegoing follows the descendants over two centuries until the two sides of the family reunite by way of two distant cousins who complete a homegoing to each other in Africa. As such, homegoing is a modern retelling of slaves' histories and the black American experience, but it is also the story of two Ghanaian tribes and the violent legacy of the transatlantic slave trade on both sides of the Atlantic. Told in the third person, Giasi's narrative shifts from Africa to America and back again. Her storytelling style relies on flashbacks, often jumping between the past and present to reveal details of each descendant's life. With so many voices, a recurring message inherent in Giasi's storytelling is that there are few absolutes in life. The ability to tell one's own story emerges as an important theme as these characters each share their experience of slavery and its long aftermath. Plot Summary Homegoing begins with a fire set by Mame as she flees the Fanti village where she was a captive slave. She was raped by Kabacher and gave birth to Effia before fleeing deep into Asante territory, where she marries and gives birth to Essie. These two half-sisters grow up unaware of each other, finding out about one another's existence only when they inherit a golden black stone from Mame. 
Effia is married to an Englishman who was the governor in Cape Castle, the source of the slave trade in Ghana, while Essi is captured and shipped to America from that same castle. Effia wears her stone on a necklace, and Essi loses hers in the castle dungeon before being shipped away. Homegoing is a historical fiction novel by Y.A.A. Giasi, a Ghanaian-American novelist born in 1989. Homegoing was published in 2016 and was awarded the 2017 Hemingway Foundation Pen Award, the 2016 John Leonard Prize for Outstanding Debut Novel, and the National Book Foundation's 5 Under 35 Award in 2016. Written in the tradition of Alex Haley's roots, the saga of an American family 1976 Giasi tells the story of one 18th century Akan family, tracking it across seven generations after it is split into two by the transatlantic slave trade. Homegoing follows the descendants over two centuries until the two sides of the family reunite by way of two distant cousins who complete a homegoing to each other in Africa. As such, Homegoing is a modern retelling of slaves' histories and the black American experience, but it is also the story of two Ghanaian tribes and the violent legacy of the transatlantic slave trade on both sides of the Atlantic. Told in the third person, Giasi's narrative shifts from Africa to America and back again. Her storytelling style relies on flashbacks, often jumping between the past and present to reveal details of each descendant's life. With so many voices, a recurring message inherent in Giasi's storytelling is that there are few absolutes in life. The ability to tell one's own story emerges as an important theme as these characters each share their experience of slavery and its long aftermath. Homegoing begins with a fire set by Mame as she flees the Fanti village where she was a captive slave. She was raped by Kabacher and gave birth to Effia before fleeing deep into Asante territory, where she marries and gives birth to Essie. These two half-sisters grow up unaware of each other, finding out about one another's existence only when they inherit a golden black stone from Mame. Effia is married to an Englishman who was the governor in Cape Castle, the source of the slave trade in Ghana, while Essie is captured and shipped to America from that same castle. Effia wears her stone on a necklace, and Essie loses hers in the castle dungeon before being shipped away. Effia's son Kwe is coerced into taking over a position of authority in procuring and trading captives, though he would prefer to live a different life with his childhood friend Kudjo. In the American South, ESI's daughter Ness has been enslaved since birth. Ness, her husband Sam, and their infant son, Kojo, attempt to escape slavery, but while Kojo escapes, Ness and Sam are caught. Ness is sold to another master, while Sam is hanged. Kwe's son James is a Santi royalty and in line to take over the slave trade. However, James's moral reservations lead him to abandon his family and start a new life with a peasant girl he loves. Meanwhile, Kojo Freeman is living as a free black man in Baltimore in 1850 with his pregnant wife, Anna, and their seven children. Anna is kidnapped and sold into slavery, and she commits suicide as her son H is born in slavery by Caesarian. James's daughter Abena is continually waiting for her childhood friend Ohin Niarko to honor her in marriage. She gets pregnant from an affair with him, but she leaves the village to join a Christian school in Kumasi, where she has a kua. In America, H is arrested and sentenced to 10 years in the prison leasing system for a crime he did not commit. He works off his sentence, gaining skills that allow him to establish a family and home as a free man. Akua is a troubled young woman who grew up in the Christian school after her mother, Abena, was murdered by a missionary. She unintentionally kills her two daughters in a fire, her son Yah survives but is scarred for life. H's daughter Willie moves to Harlem as part of the Great Migration with her husband Robert, who leaves her to pass as white in Manhattan. Willie is left to raise her son, Sonny, on her own. Yah grows up to be a teacher in Africa. He is estranged from his mother, Akua, but once he falls in love with his housemaid, Esther, she helps him. Return to his mother, Sonny, a young man at the beginning of the civil rights movement, becomes addicted to heroin. Willie helps Sonny on his path to sobriety, and Sonny becomes a steady father figure to his son Marcus. Marjorie is the daughter of Yah and Esther, born in Africa but attending school in Alabama, where she struggles with cultural differences. Her grandmother, Akua, shares their family history with Marjorie each summer. Marjorie and Marcus meet in San Francisco while he is in a graduate program at Stanford. The two instantly connect and eventually return to Cape Coast, where they heal their family's long separation and legacy of trauma.